So I think we'll get started. So good afternoon and welcome to our spring slash summer webinar and meeting. My name is Christy Mortar and I'm the chair of the CTS Infrastructure Research Council. And I work for Hennepin County in the Transportation Operations Department. I will be helping to facilitate today's webinar and meeting, which is sponsored by the CTS Transportation Infrastructure Research Council. So just a little bit of background on the council. Um, the CTS councils provide opportunities for transportation professionals and researchers to share information on current transportation issues and trends. They bring together university faculty and staff with public and private sector agencies to recommend direction, participate in improving the center's research, education, and engagement programs. I'd also like to let you know that Sam Han Duvala from CTS is with us today supporting the webinar and she's gonna share a link with more information on the councils in the chat shortly. So today's webinar features a presentation on sensing the future of infrastructure. I will share a little bit more about that in a moment, but first I'd like to turn it over to our council vice chair, Beth Angam, who is co-facilitating the webinar with me today. Thank you, Christy. My name is Beth Engum, and I'm a senior transportation project manager and engineer at Bolton and Mink. So we're looking forward to audience participation. We had quite a few folks register today. So we're going to do Q&A time after uh, the presentations, of which we'll have two. And we encourage you to put your question in the chat at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll go ahead and go through those after each presentation. You can also raise your hand during the Q&A and we'll get to you um, and can unmute you so you can share your question. And you can get credits for this event through AICP. Um, it's one and a half credits, so you just need to fill out the form that will be uploaded to the chat in case you need it. And then one final housekeeping item. If you're a student, go ahead and let us know that by putting your uh, name in the chat so that we can track the number of students that are engaging in our events. So that's enough from me. Now I'll turn it over to Christy to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Beth. So today's webinar is Sensing the Future of Infrastructure, and it will highlight how sensors and drones are being used in bridge maintenance and preservation, and then explore how such technologies may help to shape the future of transportation infrastructure. I am pleased to welcome our speakers today. Um, first, we'll have Laura Lauren Linderman, who is the Associate Professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at the University of Minnesota. And then secondly, um, Jennifer Wells from MnDOT will be presenting, and she's the State Bridge Inspection Engineer. And Lauren, I will turn it over to you if you want to share your slides. Thanks. Let me get this over. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm somehow out of practice. So hopefully, hopefully everyone can see my slides without boxes over them. But all looking good? I think it looks good. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, today to present to you a little bit about um, the kind of the problem we're facing and how with asset management and how sensors uh, can likely fill one of those uh, tools um, towards managing our infrastructure into the future. Uh, and so I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about kind of the scope of the problem um, and then go into how we can address it and where things are going to the future. Okay. Uh, so I might be preaching to the choir a little bit, uh, but um, one of the big challenges with managing our infrastructure is the balance of resource scarcity versus need. 
Uh, so there's over 19,000 bridges in the state. This includes bridges at the county local level, as well as MnDOT, um, and even some of the bridges that we have in our parks system. And this results in over 80 million square feet of deck area. And a lot of our infrastructure was built about um, 50 to 70 years ago. And so currently about 25% of that total area is over 50 years old. And within the next uh, two to three decades, if um, there isn't a lot of replacement, that number can go up to about 58%. So um, our infrastructure is starting to hit towards its design life. And you can see this um, when you look at bridge condition over years. So here I have some data pulled from the long-term bridge program from FHWA. And you can look at the percentage of bridge deck area that's been rated good, fair, poor based on NBI ratings. Um, and so we've been really good about managing poor um, bridges and keeping that um, consistently low. Uh, but uh, what we're seeing now is kind of this swap between bridges rated in good or fair condition. Um, so we now have more bridges rated in fair uh, versus uh, good. And so as the number of bridges in fair condition increase, um, the ability for us to maintain those um, at that level is going to become even more challenging. Um, and so we have that coupled with um, limited funding resources. So um, the need has for the state of Minnesota over the next 20 years has been put at about $8 billion. Um, and if we continue our current funding approach um, and include the money from the most recent IIJA, um, we have about $4 billion provided. So this leaves us with about a $4 billion gap. And so um, the big question is, how do we um, manage our infrastructure with limited resources? Um, one of the main strategies that we've used is looking at inspection data to prioritize our maintenance strategy. Um, and a kind of recent collapses, both in Genoa and um, the Fern Hollow Bridge, um, identify that this is kind of an, an, a challenge. And so I just wanted to touch a little bit on the most, one of the more recent ones. We had the Fern Hollow Bridge, which was um, the Forbes Avenue Bridge um, that collapsed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, back in January, 2022. Um, it's a K-frame type structure that was constructed from cold weathering steel. And so you had these, uh, structural legs that were built up members from web plates and, um, and flanges that were constructed from this cold weathering steel. And um, maintenance issues um, ended, resulted in really high corrosion of these components. And so um, this corrosion was well documented in by inspection reports over time. So here, these are photos from a 2021 inspection report of the Southwest bridge leg. Um, and you can see instances with 100% section loss. Um, and so the most recent report from the NTSB um, highlighted um, that although maintenance was identified as needed in inspection reports, it wasn't necessarily completed. And so they recommended the FHWA um, develop a, and encourage a risk-based data-driven process uh, to help identify, prioritize, and perform follow-up actions to kind of build off of these inspection reports. And so um, one of the key tools that we have to do that is asset management. Uh, MnDOT's a leader in asset management. Uh, I thought this vision uh, that they have in their most recent transportation asset management plan was really well done, where they stated to, to effectively manage transportation assets by mitigating risk, um, that's our goal, and we do that by optimizing return on investment and using the best available information and tools. And one of the ways to really improve our return on investment is to identify and perform early preservation activities. Um, so using data, can we identify um, possible repairs um, or replacements earlier? And then also, can we um, improve the service life of our structures? 
one kind of more recent step towards that was the inclusion of a service life design guide um, by the Mendel Bridge Office, in addition to um, the actual uh, LRFD bridge design guide. And so how can we use um, information and tools to inform these decisions? And um, there's also challenges of bringing up some of these older infrastructure components to modern design codes, um, where we have maybe different requirements for lanes and loading, as well as approaches to design. And we're designing our structures for more demanding storms uh, and loading and also evolving population requirements. So a lot of our structures were built 50 years ago. And if we're building things now, we'd like them to look 50 years in the future. And you can imagine things might change uh, significantly. And so um, we're trying to kind of balance all these different um, components. And then uh, and data is an effective way to strategically manage these assets. And I think it also um, helps provide more guidance on um, what our structures are seeing uh, in real life. And so I wanted to touch on kind of a more classic type uh, monitoring project that was conducted in Minnesota uh, with the 35W bridge, some of our key takeaways, and then how that it fits into this kind of future sensing framework. Um, so this 35W bridge was instrumented at construction. Um, the instrumented bridge opened in 2008, and it includes over 500 sensors to investigate behavior. Uh, so we have uh, linear potentiometers that measure displacements at the bearings, um, accelerometers to look at vibration characteristics, uh, embedded vibrating wire strain gauges throughout the superstructure uh, to look at strains and temperatures, as well as additional temperature sensing through the mid span of the river span. And then also some fiber optic sensors. Um, these are two nearly identical parallel structures. Um, a majority of the instrumentation is in the southbound structure um, with some parallel instrumentation in the northbound. Um, and the goal of this instrumentation project um, was to provide insight on design assumptions. This was the first post-tension concrete box girder bridge built in Minnesota, um, or segmental concrete box girder uh, bridge. And so there were some design assumptions, particularly related to creep and temperature loading um, that were of interest. Um, also, what is the long-term behavior of this type of structure? Um, and also evaluating the sensor systems and a kind of a wired sensing system for monitoring in the future. And so kind of the two key things that I um, think came out of this are related to our understanding of the loads of the structure, um, some of the design assumptions and how that can inform future design and monitoring approaches. Um, one of the key things that we have in Minnesota are these really large thermal gradients. Um, and so you might have a situation where you have the sun on the top um, and cooler um, air below. And so you get this thermal gradient through the cross section. And what this instrumentation found that was that daily and seasonal environmental variations um, would have more impact on this bridge behavior than fully loaded trucks. Um, so what you can see here is um, curvature map from strain along the length of the bridge, um, where you have the fully loaded truck located at mid span of the river span, um, and you're looking at the associated curvature that that generated along the length. Um, and on the right, you see um, what we saw from thermal gradients alone. Um, so this is one of our large positive thermal gradients. So we have uh, the top of the bridge heated and you have the cooler air below. And so you can see the significant impact of the thermal gradient um, compared to the eight fully loaded trucks at mid-span. And while this, um, doesn't really have necessarily an impact on strength, it can have a large impact on serviceability and um, trying to limit the cracking in the structure to get a really long service design life. 
And so what we were able to do is look at the thermal gradients um, and the shape of these gradients uh, along the bridge. And so we're looking at through the depth of a cross section, um, that's the vertical axis on these plots, and then the horizontal axis is temperature. And you get the most significant gradient through the deck, um, and then it's less severe um, through the depth. And what you can see here on the left is positive gradients where you have warmer surface and cooler below. Um, and then on the right, you have a cooler um, top surface and then warmer um, below. And what we use for design uh, is the ashto gradient, um, which is the uh, closely dotted line that has this bilinear form, um, plotted against some of the observed gradients that we saw in the deck um, for some of these larger gradients. Um, these track uh, the Priestley gradient, which is used in New Zealand, um, which uses a fifth order curve. And so if we scale that to our zone of temperature ranges here in Minnesota, we get that it matches quite well. Um, and similarly, um, you kind of see this fifth order curve as well for the negative gradient. Um, and the area under that curve is larger than the ashto curves. Um, and so you'll underestimate the stresses that you would see under these gradients. Um, and so there's a potential that you could underestimate the thermal stresses um, with the potential for having service load cracking. And so um, we found that um, these types of fifth order curves um, better approximated these measured thermal gradients. Um, and these uh, thermal gradients were regularly exceeding the code levels um, throughout the life of the, the 10 years of data we've looked at. And so that would be something you would want to consider um, for future designs. And actually, the um, thermal ranges and bridge temperature that we've observed here is actually informed uh, the rehabilitation of neighboring bridges to the 35W bridge, particularly the 10th Avenue bridge. Um, so it gives some insight into kind of local demands um, and some of those design assumptions, particularly when looking at environmental effects on the structure. The other um, kind of key finding that came out of this was related to the time dependent behavior of the concrete used. Um, so as you're aware, if you subject concrete to a uniform um, compression load, um, you will get creep and shrinkage strain. Uh, and there's different models that are used to kind of capture this behavior and why do we care? We're worried about post-tension losses as you get creep of your structure as well as um, bearing run at the, at the edges. And so there's different models that track this. They all have wild, widely different predictions of how this creep um, progresses with time. And one of the big challenges of these types of models and experiments is if you've ever done lab work trying to do these types of tests over a really long time under controlled environmental conditions can be tricky. Um, and your in-situ structures often have really different volume to surface ratios and different um, conditions that are hard to capture in a lab setting. And so the data from this structure really allowed us to compare what we were seeing with predictions for different models to get an idea of which provided a reasonable um, kind of inference. Um, and so what we're looking at here is um, data at the longitudinal deflections at the bearings between the end of the main structure at span three and span four. Um, and we're looking at um, the longitudinal deflection in comparison uh, to um, the other predicted models. Okay. Um, and so what you see on the left is over kind of the first 10 years of data, and then I've zoomed in on the right. Um, and initially creep is quite quick, and then it slows down. Some models don't have this significant um, slowdown, um, but what we did see is that um, our data 
tracks most closely with the CEB 1990 model that conservatively approximates the data. Um, and it's larger than what you would see, oops, sorry, predicted by either AASHTO or ACI 209. Um, and this was actually, um, the bridge was designed with CEB 1978, which was even more conservative, but it gives us an insight into kind of what would be expected behavior and how do our assumptions um, compare with what's actually occurring. And so um, this gives us the ability to um, inform future designs, as well as use this information to then track long-term performance and behavior of our structure. Um, all of these sensing systems were kind of traditional wired, either embedded or contact systems. And our sensing tools are really progressing beyond this. And so kind of what I showed already were these classic embedded systems or contact type measurements where you're measuring with sensors directly placed on the structure. Um, but there's been a kind of a revolution in non-contact type sensing systems. Um, and these can kind of revolutionize the amount of data we have access to. Um, and so I, I know my other speaker today will be talking about the use of unmanned uh, aerial vehicles for inspection um, and the tools that kind of have made that really reasonable, where you have cameras for photogrammetry and crack detection, the ability to generate really detailed 3D models uh, and access uh, spaces that are much harder to access with routine visual inspection. Um, and then you also have the advent of kind of indirect sensing or monitoring where you're using onboard sensing in vehicles or even smartphones of the passengers in vehicles in order to understand um, the system, do a system identification of your structure or even look at the vehicle structure interaction and variations in that to try and identify changes in the structure. Now, there's been a lot of developments in this um, born out of improvements in computer vision technology and signal processing techniques, um, but there are still ongoing challenges, including um, robustness, um, noise, resolution, scalability, and accuracy in how to deploy these technologies. And really what's been shown is that incorporating kind of your traditional embedded and contact measurements can really supplement and improve the importance of these novel sensing modalities, including kind of indirect monitoring and um, non-contact monitoring tools. And what additional challenges for implementing any type of monitoring system um, for civil infrastructure um, is that our infrastructure depends on many complex phenomena. So original SHM um, really took off from aerospace and other types of structures where you have a kind of a more standardized type structure um, where they're not necessarily subjected to these large variations in behavior when you're actually doing these monitoring. And so if we look at what I'm showing here, this is displacement data from the 35W bridge. And what I actually cared about is what I showed you before, which is a kind of more simple time dependent um, behavior. That's what we are trying to capture. But what we're actually measuring in any one of these sensing systems is what's shown in the black line. So that's our actual measured bearing displacement. And you can see really large seasonal variation. Um, so that's environmental loading, as well as daily variation of the structure. Um, and so the challenge is how do you deal with variations in kind of this baseline to get meaningful information um, out of the system? And so our baseline data varies over the course of a day or a season. Um, and this normal safe variation can mask any anomalous behavior. And as a result, data from individual sensors alone are really not meaningful. You have to have both ideas of your environment, as well as maybe your loading and other sources of responses, because you can't detect something if you can't measure it. 
And so there's been a lot of advances in physics informed um, and machine learning based pattern recognition um, to kind of improve um, how we take our sensing tools and actually inform um, real like changes and in, uh, information that can help uh, stakeholders actually come up with decision processes. Um, and so in the future, looking towards where I kind of see this going is um, lower cost embedded sensing, whether it's wired or wireless, um, really helps democratize the application of um, these sensing modalities. Um, so less kind of maintenance costs. Um, you've also had significant improvements in computer vision algorithms for anomaly detection and cracking. Um, and visual inspection will always play an important role in um, monitoring our bridge structures and asset management. And so how can we augment our visual inspection to make um, their most effective uh, and help our inspectors uh, really identify key, key areas of interest? And so these feed into kind of the future of how monitoring and asset management is going um, to occur in terms of holistic pattern recognition. Um, so this would be a hybrid structural health monitoring approach that incorporates kind of physics as well as data and inspections um, to identify changes in behavior and try and prioritize uh, interventions earlier. Um, and then as well as the advent of kind of BIM modeling has encouraged this rapid growth in digital twins. Um, where you have a digital replication or replica of your system augmented by data. So it almost creates a knowledge base of your structure um, where you can more easily track key areas over time and identify kind of changes in your baseline behavior to prioritize um, improvements, as well as kind of standardization. There's been an effort um, to standardize how we do this or best practices. Um, to encourage adoption um, beyond kind of the really high-end monitoring techniques. And so just an idea of kind of what this digital twin might look like. I thought this was a really nice figure um, where you would have your 3D model. Um, you use this um, where you would update it um, based off of data or design data and scanning of what actually exists. Um, you have sensor data as well as um, human inspection data. These all get pulled into your um, model, which allows you to track behavior. Um, you can also update this model with time and predict behavior going forward to get you an idea of predictive life and life cycle costs, um, which you can then use for decision support. And so I think this is really kind of the future of where we're integrating these novel sensing modalities with these new machine learning techniques in order to get um, better asset management. And so what are the action steps um, that I think can help make this a reality? Um, so state and local transportation agencies should ensure that new infrastructure projects include performance tracking, tracking plans and life cycle assessments as part of the design stage. Um, and this is starting to be encouraged in Europe. Um, the UK actually put out kind of a memorandum of understanding of how to do this in 2020. And I think the US Department of Transportation should encourage the adoption of these types of approaches, um, but this does take effort. And so they should encourage this through incentives and technical support. Um, the observed in addition to actually asset management, I think the observed change in loads from sensing systems could be used to update our demand models as our traffic and uh, loading and climate changes. And this can also be used to inform design standards and needs for future projects. So I think the data that we gather is not only good for current asset management, but could improve the resiliency of our infrastructure uh, going forward. And so with that, I want to thank you for um, your attention. Uh, that data I presented from the 35W bridge was a 
collaboration of many people, both from MnDOT and the U. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the Center for Transportation Studies um, for their encouragement of this effort um, and the support of uh, some of my research. So uh, that my email is here as well if you have questions. Thank you, Lauren. We'll move on to the question and answer session for Lauren's presentation. Right now, if anyone has any questions, there aren't any in the chat at this time. So go ahead and raise your hand or answer, enter your question in the chat. I had one question for you, Lauren. Um, one of your presentation slides showed a sensor like in between the rebar on a bridge deck. And I was just curious on, like on a surface, like a bridge deck, um, how often would you have to place those or would you place those? And then are those expensive to you know, procure and install or maintain? Um, so the, that strain gauge that was shown installed um, within uh, the bridge, um, those actually we've found to be really hardy. We haven't needed to replace them. Um, so within that sensing system, I think over 95% of the instrumentation has survived. Um, and so um, those are quite hardy and they're not that expensive, but they do require planning. So um, you would want to place them during construction. <laughs> um, and so they require um, a little bit of like like work at the front end. I think where you start to get into the cost is um, how often do you want to measure that instrumentation um, and what is your approach to doing that? So um, a continuous type system can be a little expensive because you're maintaining that technology um, forever. <laughs> um, or if you would like more like routine or uh, kind of uh, along with an inspection schedule kind of check-in with the data. Thank you. Do we have any other Lauren, questions for Lauren? I had one question too, actually. So I, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of this research could inform future um, design standards. Mm -hmm. Are there any changes you're seeing that you would recommend to MnDOT just based on the current results of, of the data and sensors? Um, I think the biggest thing is um, the thermal loading that we're seeing in these structures. Um, I think the where we get those thermal demands is kind of interesting. We are in the same uh, zone as Texas. Um, and so the thermal gradients, I think, can be underestimated with uh, the current code. And so I think having um, some factors of safety there, particularly from a serviceability perspective, um, to limit cracking could be valuable. Um, and we've also thought a little bit about how those are accounted for in your service load combinations. Often these really large gradients seem to occur at the same time as large traffic demands. And so how do you balance um, that within your um, service load um, calculations? Do you have any other questions for Lauren? Now's your chance. And I kind of breezed through some of the modern sensing modalities. So if people have further questions or want information on those, I'd be happy um, to talk more about that or answer emails. And I know, I believe Jennifer's gonna be talking about the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, which I'm excited to see. So Lauren's email address is right here, and we do have a second presenter. So if you think of something while um, we listen to Jennifer, go ahead and add it. We can come back to Lauren. So thank you, Lauren. We will move ahead with Jennifer's presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Let me get the screen shared up here. Okay. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jennifer Wells from the Minnesota Department of Transportation Bridge Office. 
I've been an engineer with MnDOT for 22 years now this June. Um, 17 years of that was in the what was currently recalled the fracture critical bridge inspection unit now re-termed non-redundant steel tension members or NSTM. And I did five years in bridge design and bridge standards. Um, I have a bachelor's in uh, engineering from the Michigan Tech University. I'm a Uber, so I'm originally from Michigan, born and raised. I came down to Minnesota for my job at MnDOT, and I got and I have a master's degree in infrastructure systems engineering from the University of Minnesota. So today I'm going to talk about how we've been using drones and implementing these um, statewide and where we're at today. So the presentation outcomes um, are listed here. Uh, we started this process initially as a phased research approach in 2015. Uh, since then, we've droned hundreds and hundreds of bridges and other structures to date. Um, we have four phases of research, each one building upon the last. Um, so those are all pub published on the MnDOT research website. If you go there and put in the search bar, drone or UAS or UAV, those will pop up for you. So all those reports are there. Um, so for successful inspection, we need the ability to detect conditions and deficiencies accurately, document them, be able to communicate them. Uh, drones help us with all of these. So let's get started. When we started in 2015, uh, we did an assessment of the different US UAS technology out there. We needed something that was inspection specific, uh, a camera that can look up and down, can sense objects and avoid them, be able to fly without GPS because you need to get under bridge decks and drones tend to lose the GPS signal when flying under there and they'll return to home. Uh, we need all the photo, video and thermal imaging capabilities and drones that can be flown in confined spaces. So out there, there is, Commercial drones, so these are twenty to thirty-five thousand uh, dollars. They their cost is because of the cameras on them. Uh, these, this is a list of some of them that are super expensive in that range. Their benefits are sensor size, their re reliability of their batteries, durability, and purpose built for inspection. So in two thousand fifteen, there were no drones like this on the market. Uh, so we used an Arian Sky Ranger military grade drone um, with the cap. The camera can only look down, but it was a, a good start. By the time we got to our second phase, a uh, company out of Switzerland, SenseFly, had a prototype and they allowed, to, allowed us to use that in our phased research. And since then, we've come a long way with where we're at with drones that can do structure inspection especially at the consumer level drone grade. So these are the, the cheaper um, models, 500, 200, 2000, or $3,000, <clears> such as the DGI Mavic, which has op, op, object avoidance and also can hold thermal. The benefits, obviously low cost, smaller size, easier to carry around, um, more risk tolerance, but they're, you're not getting the camera capabilities as you would with a commercial drone. And there's less sophisticated flight planning with these as well. Um, for the most part, except for now we have uh, Skydio, which is an American-based company that has come into the market arena, and they have, um, it's a consumer-level drone that, that has very sophisticated flight planning abilities. <clears throat> okay, so here is an example of the importance of sensor size. So uh, this is on our St. Croix River crossing bridge. Um, this is actually me over the side, <clears throat> mapping out cracks with chalk, how long they are. This is one of our super trucks. We have six of them that we own in, in the state. And there's somebody underneath the bridge in the basket, also measuring out cracks. And this picture was taken by a drone that was way high above me. I didn't even hear it. Um, well, I was next to a running truck too, but I didn't hear it. Um, and the drone didn't move. So this is like a professional level sensor camera would be 40 megapixels. Consumer level is 12 to 20 megapixels. And without the drone even moving, this is how far it zoomed in onto what I was doing. So in order to get better accuracy with drone uh, imagery, 
uh, we use the propeller points, so automatic control, ground control points. We're able to geolocate defects that are important and monitor crack growth over time because all defects are geospatially correct. The amount of accuracy we can get is one to two millimeters, which is perfect enough for, for our purposes in inspection. So bridge inspection goals um, for any typical bridge inspection that we do, there's the planning phase and they're out in the field detecting conditions and deficiencies. You're documenting these and then you need to communicate these to the bridge owners and other stakeholders that, that have a need for them. This was also on our St. Croix River crossing um, 2018 before the pandemic. Um, we had our drone out there. We had a nice little scooter <laughs> that could get us down below the bridge where the porta potty was because it's a long bridge. We're actually going to be inspecting this bridge again here um, this August. <clears throat> so, this is like an example of the inspection planning. So, this shows a, uh, so this was a planned mission, flight plan mission, doing an, an autonomous flight to get an idea of the bridge and where you're at. You can point out things like what spans are, the number of the piers. You can show important locations like access hatches or um, what roadways are below, where the teams will be at. Um, what we found is that notifying the property owners in the, in the area that we will be flying drones is very important. You need to be transparent, always wear your PPE. So you look like you belong there. Um, we also have inspection ahead signs or drone inspection ahead signs. Out of all the flights that we have done since 2015, we've had no complaints. Um, I have gotten calls occasionally about somebody flying a drone on the high bridge in St. Paul in the dark. And I'm like, that nah, wasn't us. <laughs> so, you know, cause there are a lot of recreational flyers out there that don't really abide by the rules sometimes. You also want to review field conditions before and after. Where are the power lines? Um, how much tree foliage is there? Where are your landing and takeoff areas? And make sure that besides your visual observer, so that's a person that makes sure you're uh, somebody's always looking out for the drone while the pilot is flying, so that you're you're not you always have that visual line of sight. If you want to have a, a next an extra person there if you have um, are in a more public area and people will have questions because you don't want the pilot or the VO to be distracted while flying. And people do get curious and they you know they think it's pretty neat so they, they have questions and we we will we welcome that. So detecting defects and deficiencies by access. So we get this question a lot are you looking to replace actual inspectors with drones or robots? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. You can't remove the human factor from this, especially when bridge inspection condition states are so subjective. We're using this simply as an access tool and for better data. And in conjunction with our traditional access tools, so our aerial work platforms, our snooper trucks, we have, um, I have staff that are certified in rope access and structure climbing. We use ladders, binoculars, whatever we need to do to get access. So documenting conditions and deficiencies. So this can, these modeling things can be taken from the drone itself. It can also be taken from your camera that you're taking pictures out in the field with. Uh, the different reality modeling software reviews. Uh, we started with PIX4D um, in the beginning and then switched over to Context Capture, which is a Bentley product. Since we are a Bentley state, we already had the software. So it's like, well, why purchase something that we don't need if we already have this? So your input is your images, your ground control, your drone data, whatever you want to put in. You want to make sure you have good overlap. You need a, a 70 to 90 percent overlap of the imaging to produce a proper 3D model. And then you can get a bunch of output, ortho mosaics, point clouds, mesh, CAD drawings. Um, and, but you need a high end computer to process these things. So that is something we're actually in talks right now with Bentley to get around that fact. So here's an example of a deliverable. So you can see there were, we, we have artificial intelligence um, package as part of context capture that I've been working with Bentley for the past two years now, providing them with photos and uh, data and um, information on how, uh, how are we, how can the artificial intelligence detect these cracks and map them out on our models. Um, we've come a long way. It's actually like a learning software, like your iPhone, like your iPhone gets used to 
how you talk or how you text over time and it learns your behaviors. Same thing with this crack detection um, piece. It learns over time what is really a crack and what isn't a crack because you can say, oh, that's not a crack, that's a joint and you can unclick that. And they said, oh, that you missed this, that's a crack. So it learns over time. They have the same um, component for spalls and section loss as well. Um, I have, our, it's in the demo phase right now. So I'm working with Bentley on uh, getting it to where we want it to be. So that's pretty exciting because measuring cracks on a bridge deck takes a long time. <laughs> and you don't even know if you're seeing the seeing them right or not. And this is our traditional reporting method, paper and pen. So you put inspection booklets together with paper, the past inspection notes and photo log, and we go out and we use that. Uh, years ago, we tried um, tough laptops in the field, but they just weren't up to par back then. Um, you know, the, they wouldn't work well in certain environments. You couldn't see very well. Um, that's changed a lot uh, over the years now, and we're going to look to do that again now that we are really getting into this 3D modeling so we can have that bridge in the field on a tablet, the 3D model, and adding your photos and your notes right in the model itself. So this has been a long time coming that I've been wanting something like this. So let, look at this picture here. So this is how far we've come. This was from 2015, and you can see how grainy this looks here. This was when we first started uh, doing the modeling, but the point of this picture here is to show you all these little points here on it. So you click on each point and that will bring up uh, the note where you can edit it, the name of the uh, member you're looking at, the, the coordinates of that element, and also it, it will bring up that specific picture for that area. So through these four phases of research and now to implementation, which we just started last year, um, in MnDOT, uh, the benefits for safety improvements, not just for inspectors, but for public, because then you have you can have less work like, uh, work zones or lane closures if you can do an inspection um, that way. Uh, you get quality gains by getting access you couldn't get to before. Because we noticed um, when I worked in Metro for a mobility in 2017, uh, in scoping, bridge scoping, um, we were finding that uh, the inspection data was not accurate enough because they weren't being get inspectors weren't getting the access they needed to make um, accurate depictions of the defects. So a, a project would go out for a bridge maintenance project. It would get bid based on the inspection data, and they get out there and they find out, oh, there's a lot more wrong than than this report said. So we're going to have to jack the prices up. Well, that caught the attention of you know management in MnDOT, like we can't have this happen. You know this can't be happening. We need to get better access. Um, we also did a cost savings and a safety uh, analysis, um, which I'll show on a different slide. The challenges were really a lot in the beginning. Uh, there was a big learning curve. We went into this very naively. You know, we just saw a <clears throat> there was like a presentation or something at the at the U of farmers using drones to monitor their their crops, and we thought, ooh, wouldn't that be cool if that could be used for helping inspect bridges? So we thought, yeah, we'll get this little toy and fly it around and. There was no drone program with our aeronautics office yet. And, and they're like, whoa, lady, you need to slow down. <laughs> we need to, there's all these rules of airspace and FAA and all this stuff. So um, aeronautics has been very involved with the program since then. They also, um, for the first few couple of years, they had a, a lawyer assigned to us so that we didn't break any laws or regulations. Um, but that has since gone a lot differently. So since part 107 came out in 2016, you, you now don't have a need a commercial aircraft pilot to fly your drone for commercial purposes. Uh, they're not hands-on, obviously. They don't replace an inspector. Eventually, you know, there are prototypes in the works of drones that can do non-destructive testing. Um, acceptance was a big thing. That's why we were very open with the public when we first started. Um, I know I did a TV interview. We had a lot of articles written. Our rules and regulations were really steep in the beginning, but they have since um, lightened up quite a bit. We can now fly at night. There's waivers you can get to fly over traffic or, or th certain things like that. The other challenge now that we're dealing with is data storage. Where are we going to put all of this data? As I said, we have we did a safety analysis remo removing inspectors from harm's way. We showed that you know how many work zone fatalities there could be. 
So you can see this is what was done in 2015 because it's 2014 data. And like I said, out of all the time in the flights we've had, we've never had anything happen other than a drone losing signal and either bumping into the bridge or going into the river. That's a, And that's only been two instances. So the FAA is focused on airspace, but we really need to look at the overall risks and what, what you know, what risks are not. We also did a initial cost savings analysis to show how long it would take to do um, an inspection with a snooper as opposed to a drone. It doesn't work always in every case, but it does in a lot of other cases. So the cost savings comes from, you know, having traffic control and access uh, equipment reduced or eliminated. And this is based on bridges that are suitable for drones. Not every bridge is suitable for using a drone on. Bridge candidates that we found work well are large bridges, bridges in open areas, bridges that depend on lane closures, and ones that don't work, obviously, as of right now, over high ADT roadways, unless you get waivers from the FAA. Um, drones don't like wooded areas very much. Um, Skydio, the Skydio drones are, are very good, though, at obstacle avoidance. They can go around those things. Initially, with all the data storage that the drones collect, you know, it's not just megabytes, it's gigabytes and terabytes. Um, initially, we had all of these external hard drives we got, we got because our network servers are just too full of information to store this type of data on. So we traditionally put them on in external hard drives just to get by, um, then had a meeting with Minute, our, our Minnesota's IT, and they foresaw this coming in the future. So they got a, what they called a super storage server um, separate from the office's network drives. Um, and we have a bridge folder set up specifically for us. Uh, each district has its own folder. We all can see what each other's doing statewide. Um, but it's kind of crude. I, I'm the owner of the folder. So if I want anybody wants access to it, I have to manually enter them in the system. And then also I don't have any, there's no way to put permissions on the individuals either. I can't just give them read only. It's all just a free for all. Um, but it's only internal to MnDOT, so I can't share across um, other, you know, entities or bridge owners. So that's kind of where we're hung up right now. We've also, since the pandemic, have been working with Microsoft and Bentley and Collins Engineering, developing artificial intelligence and digital twins. So the idea is to have like an augmented reality where you get data from in the field um, using this Microsoft HoloLens let, um, headset getting the bridge component and basically can bring the bridge into the office where you can see it, manipulate it, move it around with your hands, things like that. It's pretty trippy. <laughs> I had one for a while of the HoloLens. We have two of them. Uh, then I gave it to my uh, newer employee I hired last year who's a lot younger than me and more tech savvy. So I'm like, have at it. So this is the idea using the HoloLens in the field or not and getting a mixed reality version, then you get a bridge uh, digital twin. So here you can see uh, the girl looking at a peer column and you can map out your defects. You can rotate it, you can move it around. Basically, it's like you're at the bridge. It's pretty, pretty trippy. Uh, the, um, the consultant that we do use with this research likes to talk about the metaverse. So this is a slide from him. Um, so, but, but like I said, it's a virtual space where multiple people can visit once and meet and collaborate, whether you're in the field or you're in a different office, you're in a different district. Um, we, this is where we want to get to so we can collaborate and get uh, findings to the people sooner to make more educated decisions. So this is from a Skydio uh, drone. It's a 3D scan. This is an example of using artificial intelligence for data collection. They use simply defines a volume to scan. And then the drone explores that space on its own. You just press a button and it goes. Um, it calculates what needs to be scanned, performs it autonomously. And then the grid represents the object to be modeled and the colors change from yellow to purple as data is collected. I've actually seen this done in person. We had a, this just this week we had a, uh, a peer exchange with uh, South Dakota and Tennessee and Skydio representatives were there as well when they brought their drones. What's cool and upcoming is uh, they come up with these docked drones. Um, so they, it's basically like a little garage for your drone. 
and it can you can fly it then from the docking station out from like your home. It's that's crazy. There's going to be a lot of things to overcome with that out in um, air, national airspace, but in inside a like a, a warehouse or something like for Amazon, they could have these drone docks if they don't already, and they can they have the drone fly out and do inventory. It's crazy. This is an example of uh, drone work in. in incorporated into a workflow for the Stone Arch Bridge in, in Minneapolis, the rehab project. Uh, what they did first was go out in the field and take uh, drone data capture was the first step in the process to plan ahead. So then they created their digital twin. So that's they created from the images collected with the drone and ground control. And then they went and did the field inspection. So inspectors use model, the model and tablets, computers to input their field inspectionals right on the model. Uh, you didn't have to have a sketch or describe locations or deficiencies anymore. There, this resulted in less time in the field and more accurate results. Next, it goes into the rehabilitation design and plans. So the models were used as part of the design process. So team members on the design team could visit the bridge virtually to make design, design decisions. Measurements and quantities could be made more accurate, accurately, reducing the risk for the owner. Next, it'll be also shared with the construction for the contractors during bidding to reduce the risk and hopefully result in more competitive bids. It's a great use case. Um, so this is all the field notes showing on this bridge, all the little dots here. Um, and this is just a small portion of the bridge, maybe a quarter of it. So you just click on each of these dots here and you can go see the actual photo from that and, and add in notes. So digital twin of river spans during a river drawdown. This is, so this was a unique opportunity to collect data on portions of the bridge that are normally underwater. So this is really cool. Um, models were tiled, are tiled. So the more we zoom in, the more detail we'll see as shown in this picture. Um, it's a zoomed in portion of the previous model shown. So we can easily see the concrete scaling, exposed reinforcement and channel bottom conditions. Uh, this would normally have been conveyed in text in sample images or a photo, but with this, we can do it from there. So this, this is actually in uh, the consultant's office. Um, he had the snow, stone arch bridge right in his office there. Um, they could be viewed in mixed reality with the Microsoft HoloLens and an application from Bentley. So this environment approximate a field inspection with the same sense of scale as if you're in the field. I mean, you literally can plop yourself on the bridge deck and walk it. It's really, really cool. Measurements can also be made at this time and defects can be added. This is kind of how it looks here. Um, if I had the video, um, I just didn't want to do video over uh, webinar because it can get dicey there, but literally you can take your hands and you just move the model with your hands and rotate it. You can zoom in like this. It's just, it's really cool. So you're easily able to move around the bridge compared to the snoopers and rope access. It's so much easier explaining to people too what, where a defect is when they can see a model this way, especially if they don't go out in the field very much. So these are the digital twin benefits for this project. Obviously improved data quality, reduced risk for designers, reduced risk for contractors, better collaboration and inclusion because uh, a contractor did this uh, or a consultant you know, they have different um, IT issue, issues than MinDOT does. They have less restrictive ones. So all of this could be shared via the cloud to MinDOT personnel and anybody else involved in the project. The other issue it can be a downside is the data increase. So like if I, if I write a report in our inspection software, it's usually around six megabytes, six to 10 megabytes on average. Doing a digital twin inspection report, two terabytes. So you can see the, the impending problem here, especially even if we have this separate server, it it's gonna get crazy really quick. So we need to get to a point where we, we're using, utilizing the cloud. And that's what we're in talks with with Bentley right now. Because if you utilize their cloud, their data, the data gets stored there. Um, you don't need a supercomputer because it runs through theirs. Um, it's just gonna be so much more seamless. So these are the conclusion, knowing your intended purpose. Not all drones are the same. Uh, photogrammetry has some very large drones that are equipped with LIDAR. So they're completely different than ours, but they have a different purpose. Um, initially drone was used for access, but documentation and commuting 
communication of the results has been even more compelling. This is just a tool to supplement. We're not gonna replace an entire inspection with this. Make sure you collaborate with owners and stakeholders to share knowledge and promote future advancement. And um, speaking of that, uh, we collect, I have created a drone inspection subcommittee within the state. Uh, we meet twice a year before inspection season, after inspection season. Uh, we have district members on there. We have local agencies that drone on there. We have the DNR there. We have aeronautics and also an FAA representative on there. Um, so we collaborate and um, we can share knowledge and what worked and what doesn't work good for us. So that, that's, that's been a really great thing going forward. And you need to know, what are you going to do with this data? Where are you going to store it? And how are you going to use it? These are the links to uh, phase three and four reports. Uh, we also have a um, drone bridge inspection manual that's in our bridge instructors program manual, uh, which is also on the, on the bridge office website, uh, free to anybody. Uh, our aeronautics office wanted us to have a specific drone uh, user manual just for our specific needs. And the MnDOT Office of Aeronautics also has their own drone policy that we follow uh, extensively. So we're very connected to the um, Aeronautics Office with everything we do. Uh, the software where we plan our flight missions in is called Drone Logbook. We uh, share the cost of that with the aeronautics folks. Um, that's where we put all our drones are input. All the pilots are in input with their credentials. Um, we track our flight plans, um, missions, how long we've done. It's a really good program to make sure that we don't screw anything up. And every mission that we plan <clears throat> uh, has to be approved by the aeronautics office for MnDOT. So, and that turnaround time on that's usually a couple hours, not, no big deal. And I just had a flight plan last week up in Grand Forks and uh, just a funny little story. I, <laughs> I was trying to get, I was getting uh, shots of upstream and downstream channel because the drone can take some really good photos that way and also a profile of the bridge. So this is a bridge over the Red River. And I was coming back to the landing area and a big old gaggle of pigeons swooped in on my drone and we're, we're not happy with it. Um, I, I, it didn't wreck the drone. My One of my propellers though got a wing and a feather went flying, but, and then I landed. So yeah, and then I went up again to see, was it just a fluke? Nope, they, there they came again, right after the drone. So um, that was kind of funny. It was exciting, but uh, that's all I have unless anybody has any questions right now. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. If you, um, so for your, you showed the development of the 3D models with the digital twin from the drone data. Um, are those computational as well, or is they, are they most for visualizing effects? Like, a, you mean as far as measurements and... Or like, can you, could you run, um, run that model under like, as like an FEM type model, or is it purely visual for like tracking? Uh, different inspection data for our purposes it would be but I think it like um, one of the outputs can be inputting it into a CAD model um, where you can do all those you know design type things with it I have one question from the chat from AJ Wilson he asks what model UAS is MnDOT's most used for bridge inspection so we got a grant from Federal Highway in 2018. We didn't get our drones till 2021, um, but we uh, we went with the DGI. So we went with DGI Matrice 300 RTK, um, but Aeronautics typically uses that one mostly from us, so they want to buy it. Um, and then we have a number of the DGI Mavic Pros, uh, the two version. Those seem to be really good enough for us for our inspection purposes right now. But with a lot of entities, I know the state of Florida passed a law for state agencies that they don't want, they don't want using D, DGI products. So we're going to have to migrate from that at some point. <clears throat> um, so we have 33 drones right now. Um, we're looking we're looking to get Skydios next because those work better for underneath the bridge. They 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 don't get um, mess, their signal doesn't get as messed up from the steel and stuff as as the uh, DGIs do. 
and they have that obstacle avoidance feature, you literally cannot fly it into a bridge at all. Um, it will stop itself. So that's the that's the route we're going to continue to go. Um, we're going to be looking at applying a, for a smart grant this fall um, for that purpose and uh, get on the Skydio bandwagon because it's a really cool drone. It was originally a drone that was uh, created for recreational purposes. So like people that are do extreme mountain biking or things like that, they have the drone will literally follow the person through the woods and all over the mountains or whatever, and it never hits anything. So they can get footage of themselves doing really cool stuff. So they've come a long way. Um, they have a new drone that's coming out sh shortly. Um, and it's got, it's one that has a really, really big camera on it, like 60 megapixels or something like that from what I heard. So, so that'll replace our Matrice drone. We also have um, yeah. Metro, they have uh, that cage drone that you saw, the Elios. That one was made for confined spaces. It's very touchy to fly though. So we don't fly that one very much. Christy, do you have a question? I was curious. Yeah, thank you. I was curious, like how many staff members at MnDOT are qualified, I guess, to drive a or use a drone? And then like, what kind of training requirements do you have to implement before they're able to, to use the drone? So that's a good question. That comes through the FAA part 107. Um, there are like online training classes you can do to take that test. Um, but I have, there's so much stuff on the internet that's free. So I have, over time, I just um, accumulated all of the, the uh, training materials that I've gotten over the years. Our Office of Aeronautics did an initial training in 2020 online. Um, I have all that material. And then you go, if you pay like 150 bucks, you go to uh, a testing center. Uh, I went and took my license test at uh, St. or Lake Elmo Airport. And it's like 60 questions. Um, you pass it once and then every two years you recertify online and it's free um, then with the FAA and they keep track of everybody's, you get it, it's the, you basically it's a, like a license. You get a, it looks like a driver's license, but for drones, um, you got a license number and everything. So uh, right now, I think we have 26 pilots in the state, all of them inspectors or engineers and aeronautics also uh, requires us to do a flight ride check as they call it. Uh, she comes out and um, has you do some twirly things, you know, do some like drone racing, you know, do, you know, just to show your skills and that you're confident in what, how you're flying. Um, so we, we do that as well. And a number of us, uh, our aeronautics office, every so often they, they would uh, host ground pilot school for commercial purposes. And they added a drone portion to it in recent years. So a lot of us have taken that ground pilot school at aeronautics as well. So we learn everything like a commercial pilot would do, um, you know, airspace, how to know what airspace you're in, how to plan a flight, things like that. Very cool. Just a reminder for folks, if you're having any issues with typing your question in the chat, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. you. Like there's another chat one. What staff positions other than bridge management personnel have become pilots at MnDOT? Well, that would be um, photogrammetry, our pilots. And as far as I'm not sure of anybody else in the state other than bridge people right now, but I know in District 7, they are that district uh, has somebody that uses it for maintenance and construction project purposes. So I'm hoping that's the next phase of going, you know, so now it's going to be in like on construction projects, you know, to, you know, view how the construction project is going um, and for maintenance purposes as well. But I think right now Bridge has, <laughs> is the conglomerate of pilots in the state. 
I'm going to go back to one question that we received during your presentation, Jennifer, and it's actually for Lauren. Mm -hmm. um, so this person, Bob Fasig, was having trouble getting it typed up. So for you, Lauren, you talked about anomalous behavior being masked by normal response, like the thermal gradient. Would the new monitoring technology be able to see through this masking to identify emerging problems or help with that? Yeah, I think um, the the ability to add new data sources will help lower the uncertainty um, from the variations in the baseline. Um, I also think the improvement in kind of our tools for doing um, process or looking at um, uh, statistical processing of the data, I think has also helped uh, it limit some of that, but I think there's still a ways to go, but it's definitely getting better. Thank you. So any other questions for either of these ladies? Jennifer, do you ever get public data requests for the data? Even before we use drones, yeah, we get data requests all the time. Um, the only thing that we can't give information out on is our homeland security bridges, the ones that are designated as that. But we usually we're very accommodating at getting data to folks. And I assume MinDOT probably has a policy around that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do have time for more questions. Has anybody got anything? I think this is super impressive. I've always joked about civil engineering being so low tech, um, but we're definitely going to catch up with other other forms of engineering. So thank you both for your presentations and and the contact information. If you have anything for Lauren or Jennifer, as you think about this presentation, they'll definitely take your questions. So thank you very much. Um, not sure if you have anything else to say, Christy. I was just going to mention this is the last of CTS's spring council webinars, um, but do get the research conference on your calendar since that's been scheduled for November 2nd. Yeah, I guess before we end, if the, any participants have any organizational updates that they want to share or any topics you're interested in us, you know, um, presenting in the future, um, please let us know. You can either raise your hand and we can unmute you, or if you wanna put um, information in the chat and then I can read it out loud as well. I'll maybe just give folks a minute, see if we get any comments. All right, I'm not seeing anything. So just, I guess, thanks everybody for your uh, participating today and a special thanks to Lauren and Jennifer. Those were great presentations. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.